Hello team. Today we're going to do uh, inductance and capacitors and AC circuits. I have a presentation here for you. Um, I'm going to get through this pretty quick. Uh, the majority of the technical stuff that's in here are things that we've covered before. Um, the most important part about this particular topic is the, the mathematics. So uh, working out inductive reactants, capacitive reactants, uh, how that relates to power uh, and current, power current and various voltages in a series circuit, and then how to calculate uh, phase angle and power factor. So I'll do a separate video that covers the mathematics. I'll run through uh, examples of uh, what that looks like uh, and we'll have some practice examples for you as, as well so let's go straight through this uh, presentation and let's see where this goes okay so inductive reactants we should know what inductive reactance is now inductive reactance is a type of resistance it is uh, it resists the the flow of current but it, it's the resistance that's provided by an inductor as opposed to a resistor. Um, it's measured in ohms, but it's called inductive reactants. We, uh, we write that as XL. XL is our inductive reactants. Um, the formula for XL is 2 pi FL. L being the, uh, the inductance of our inductor in Henry's. So that's not going to change for our particular inductor, whatever that inductor is, the, the number of Henry's in that inductor will be the same. So uh, if you look at that formula, then XL equals 2 pi FL, that means that our uh, inductive reactance is dependent on frequency. As the frequency changes going up or down, so too the inductive reactance will change. Um, so when we're working this out in the circuit, we need to know what our frequency is, we need to know what the inductance is. This is useful. Um, this is useful for uh, where we are trying to um, block or allow different frequencies through in a circuit, right? Because uh, if we can calculate um, our, oh, sorry, our resistance, the resistance or induct, uh, reactance in this case of the inductor will be different to different frequencies. So I could block some frequencies and allow some frequencies, if that kind of makes sense. So uh, if we have a coil with an inductance of 0 0.02 Henry's, note that it is, that is written in Henry's. We always need to, our, um, our formula will always have the inductance in Henry's. If, the form, if, we're given, um, if we're given a value in milli Henry's or micro Henry's or whatever it was, what, we would need to convert it back to Henry's before we put it into this formula. So determine the inductive reactance for the following frequencies. XL equals 2 pi FL. So that's 2 times pi times 25. That would be our frequency in this case times 0 0.02 plus 3.14 ohms. And then we can see if we go through the next example, we change the frequency from 25 to 50. And then the answer is double. 3.14 becomes 6.28. So we've doubled the frequency. We've doubled the inductive reactance. Your turn, have a look at that example, see if you can work that out. 2 pi FL is your formula. The phase relationships in inductive circuits. The inductance affects a DC circuit only when the current is changing in value. So remember that there has to be a frequency, otherwise this doesn't mean anything. The, um, the inductor is only changing or opposing the change in current. It's not uh, necessarily opposing current flow itself. So if the current flow is constant and like in a DC circuit, then uh, inductive reactance doesn't exist. The, the, um, the resistance, the current flow will just be the resistance of the wire, but just the resistance of the coil. At an AC circuit, because our current is changing all the time, it's going up and down, then that um, resistance that, and reactance will exist all the time. Um, Uh, because it's changing, it's resisting the change in current. That means as the voltage goes up, the current is coming up behind the voltage. Uh, so it is lagging because our inductor is resisting 
the change in current. As the voltage increases, then we, well, our current wants to increase, right? Um, but the inductor is um, resisting that change in current. A back EMF is induced only while the current in an inductive coil is changing in value. The back EMF is also proportional to the rate of change of current. At the instant the current is at its maximum value, it is neither increasing nor decreasing. Its rate of change is zero. At this instant, both the induced EMF and the applied voltage are zero. The current is therefore greatest when the voltage is zero. That means that in a pure inductive circuit, the current lags the voltage by 90 degrees. And then we have it there. Here's our voltage. As it reaches its peak, the current is zero. As the voltage is coming down, the current is now coming up. And therefore, it reaches its peak when the voltage is at zero. So it's 90 degrees out of phase. We'll never have that. It's unlikely. We'll, we'll always have some resistance in the circuit. So we'll never have a purely inductive circuit. So we'll never have a we'll never have a phase angle of 90 degrees. Our phase angle will always be something something less than 90 degrees. All right, capacitive reactance. Inductance has some reactance when connected to an AC source. This inductive reactance is measured in ohms, is proportional to the frequency of supply. A capacitor also imposes a limit on the current that a given voltage will cause to flow in a circuit. And so two is said to have re reactance and it is measured in ohms. Capacitor acts as a complete break in a DC circuit because it's just two plates that are isolated, so there's no, no current flow. We'll get current flow into the capacitor as it charges and then nothing. But in an AC circuit, because the um, polarity is changing all the time, we're charging, discharging, charging, discharging that, those two plates, so it appears that current is flowing continuously. Uh, as the frequency is increased, increased, the capacitor causes more and more current, circuit current to flow. The capacitive reactance is inversely proportional to frequency. The formula for calculating its value is Xc, capacitive reactance, equals 1 over 2 pi of C, where Xc is the capacitive reactance in ohms, F is the frequency in hertz, C is the capacitance in farads. The current cannot flow through a capacitor because of the dielectric separating the two plates. Okay, okay. Current is not flowing through the capacitor. It will appear it's flowing into the through the capacitor. It's not. It's flowing in one side and out of the other, but it's blocked in the middle because one side is charging, the other is one side is charging positive, the other is charging negative. So we've got current going in, current coming out. The capacitor connected to a direct current supply. Current flows in the connecting wires only while the capacitor is charging. Similarly, current flows in the connecting wires only while the capacitor is discharging. An alternating current that flow is a pure purely capacitive circuit reaches its maximum value before the voltage and so it's no longer a phase it is leading the voltage that's because the voltage on the capacitor will rise as the capacitor charges but at the instant that our voltage is applied we have our maximum current flow because the, um, we're, we're trying to uh, that capacitor is get, trying to take its charge from the supply so we have a high current but a low voltage on that capacitor as the capacitor voltage increases then the capacitor current decreases because then we're not charging as fast the capacitive voltage is almost the same as the um, supply voltage so at the instant the current is at its maximum value it is neither increasing nor decreasing its rate of change is zero at this instant both the induced emf and the applied voltage are zero the current is therefore greatest when the voltage is zero that means that in a purely capacitive circuit the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees when alternating voltage is applied to a capacitor, the current reaches its maximum value before the voltage, and so it leads the voltage. And here we have it here. So think about it there. At this point at zero, we're applying the voltage, applying a voltage to the, no, rather, here, at this point here, at 90 degrees, we're now applying a voltage to the capacitor. The current will virtually instantaneously reach its maximum point because the capacitor is trying to charge up very quickly. The voltage, measured voltage across the capacitor will be nearly zero because it's not charged. As we charge it up, the voltage obviously increases. As it's charging, the difference between the capacitive voltage and supply voltage is decreasing, and therefore the current will decrease because the, the difference in voltages at the capacitor and at the supply is what's causing that current to flow. So as that difference decreases, current will also decrease. So once the voltage reaches its maximum on the capacitor, current flow will be zero. Then the polarity switches 
and so the voltage will drop away and current will increase in the opposite direction. Impedance. The total opposition offered by any circuit to alternating current is called impedance and that we use Z. To, so XC for capacitive reactants, XL for inductive reactants, X for general reactants uh, and impedance is the total of all our reactances and our resistance. So we're familiar with resistance and we know about XL and XC, we've just talked about those. Um, some AC circuits may only have resistance, so impedance will equal the resistance. So they'll be the same thing, Z and R will be the same. Other circuits may contain only inductance or only capacitance, so the impedance will equal the reactance. Z will equal XL, or if it was inductive reactance, Z would equal XL, or capacitive reactance, Z would equal XC. Most AC circuits, however, contain a combination of resistance and reactance, and therefore, uh, here are our formulas here. Now, if you look at those formulas closely, uh, and we'll examine this when I go through the, uh, the through the video on the math, uh, what you'll see there is that our Z is, uh, we're using here our Pythagoras, Pythagoras for a triangle. So Z is the hypotenuse, R is the uh, horizontal side, and our X is going to be the um, vertical side of the triangle. So that first formula here, Z equals square root of R squared plus XL squared, or Z equals square root of R squared plus XC squared. Uh, this is if we have um, a circuit with only resistance and inductive reactants. This one here is if we have a circuit with only resistance and capacitive reactants. So we've just got a triangle there, right? Um, square root of R squared plus XL squared is, uh, that's a Pythagoras theory, that um, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So that would be, uh, Z would be our A, so then the square root of B squared plus C squared equals A. So we're just using Pythagoras theory. If we have XL and XC, then we would go square root of R squared plus XL, squared, XL minus XC squared. Uh, I, I would do that separately. So you work out your reactants first, XL minus XC, so then it would be R squared plus X squared. But you can do it like this as well. Either one of these formulas is fine, as long as um, you know which one you're supposed to be using. This one, if it's only resistance and inductance, this one resistance capacitance, this one uh, for all three. And so in this case, we still use Ohm's law, I equals V over Z though, because it's impedance now, it's not resistance. So it's the same thing, it's exactly the same thing. Z is measured in ohms, it's just that we call impedance Z. So I would be V over Z, same formula. So once I've worked out the total impedance of my circuit and I have the voltage, then I go V over Z and that would be my total current. And phase the diagram for resistive circuits. The current through a resistor is in phase with the voltage. So a phase of diagram for a resistive circuit would look like this. Current, voltage, same direction, both going straight, zero degrees, they're in phase and there's no phase angle. An inductive circuit, the current is out of phase with the voltage by 90 degrees lagging. So we would have our uh, this is our um, zero degrees, so that's through the resistor. Um, well, that would be the voltage on the resistor. In this case, we're looking at the voltage on the inductor. It's going upwards, and then the current on the inductor is on the zero. So um, the current is lagging the voltage by 90 degrees. It's 90, de the voltage is 90 degrees ahead of the current. In a capacitive circuit, we have the same, but it's the opposite way around. So now we have our voltage is on the zero and the current is leading. Current is leading the voltage. If we were looking at uh, Yeah, no, we'll leave it there. Current is leading the voltage. So current is going straight up and down. Uh, voltage is on the zero. The current is ahead of the voltage or voltage is behind current. Okay, so here's a calculation for us. Calculate the total impedance. And we have a circuit here. We have an inductive, an inductor of 15 ohms. So our 
XL is for inductive reactance is 15 ohms, and then we have a resistor of 20 ohms. We have 50 volts AC applied across the circuit, and we have two amps flowing, which tells us that uh, uh, volt, our volt drop across each of those things, V equals IR, so if I have two amps flowing and that's my resistance, uh, 2 times 15 is 30, and this one here, 20 ohms times 2 amps would be 40 volts. So again, we can see here that uh, Kirchhoff's law of adding the volt drops together does not apply anymore in these types of circuits, because 30 plus 40 certainly isn't 50. Um, so if we calculate our total impedance, we go... Um, Z equals R squared plus XL squared, so that uh, the square root of R squared plus XL squared, so that's our Pythagoras theory, that's our triangle, um, which gives us 25 ohms total. We then calculate the current, I equals V over Z, 50, that's our current, that's our total voltage, applied voltage, over 25, which is our total impedance, equals 2 amps. So we have 2 amps flowing, and then this is how we would draw that as a uh, phasor diagram. That's our um, resistance here is along the bottom that's zero degrees 20 ohms and then 15 ohms going up and then this line here the green line is our total impedance which represents the hypotenuse of those two lines there we draw it going this direction because it's a phasor so it's uh, at an angle between the two of them but if you worked it out as the uh, length of that triangle which we just did that's what we did over here we worked it out as the hypotenuse of that triangle then it's going to be the same as this one here. And in fact, if we worked out the phase angle there, it would be the same as the phase angle if the line went across here. All, you, all we're really doing is we're putting that reactance over this side. It would be the same thing. The triangle is the same. So where that, where that line is, where that hypotenuse line is going, which direction it's going in is, is not important. Now what we can see is that uh, it's 25 ohms. So we could draw that physically draw that to scale and measure that line and it would give, tell us it's 25 ohms. So we have a similar example here. This is um, uh, a resistor and a capacitor. So the first thing is asking us to do is calculate the volt drop across the resistor. Well, now this time I haven't been given a voltage, but I, I've been given the current and I know the resistance. So V equals I times R. The current will always be the same in a series circuit. It's going to be the same at any point in a series circuit. So V times, uh, sorry, I times R, 2 times 50, 2 amps times 50 ohms equals 100 volts. If we calculate the volt drop across the capacitor, well, we've been told that our capacitive reactance is 10 ohms. So we do the same formula. It's going to be 2 times 10, 2 amps times 10 ohms, which would be 20 volts. Our total voltage then, we would now, we can't add those two voltages together. We saw on the last example that adding the voltages together does not, in a series circuit of this type, does not give us the total voltage. So it's not 120. What it is, is uh, again, we're going to use this triangle. So you know, voltage across the resistor, so that's on this axis, that's the horizontal because it's at zero degrees, will be 100 volts. The voltage on the capacitor will be 20 volts. And so we'd use Pythagoras theory to give us the hypotenuse, which is the, also known as the resultant vector or resultant phasor. So that's going to be voltage total equals square root of voltage on the resistor plus the voltage on the resistor squared plus the voltage on the capacitor squared. And therefore, the total voltage will equal the square root of 100 squared plus 20 squared equals 101.98 and if you drew this diagram is certainly not to scale if you drew that diagram you'd see obviously the 20 volts is going to be a lot shorter than the 100 volts so we have a long line here a short line here and so our resulting vector would look something like that we have a very shallow phase angle and the um, hypotenuse is only going to be a little bit longer than this line here because this one will be so short so we're going to go out there, and that's why we're, our um, total voltage is 101.98 volts, which is not very much different to the voltage across the resistor. A coil with an inductance of 0 0.5 henrys and a resistance of 10 ohms is connected in series with a 220 microfarad capacitor across a 15 volt, 50 hertz AC supply. Uh, 
it says here, calculate the inductive reactants, calculate capacitive reactants, calculate the impedance of the coil, total impedance of the circuit, current drawn from the supply, so the total current, voltage across the resistor, voltage across the inductor, voltage across the capacitor, and our total voltage. Okay. Uh, if you feel confident doing that, please feel free to do that now. You can pause the video and go through it yourself. Uh, that'd be great practice. If you don't, just watch this. I'm gonna go through this example pretty quickly in the PowerPoint. Uh, again, I'm gonna do an example like this in, um, in a separate video where I've, I've written it all out by hand and we will go through each part individually. Uh, and then I'm going to, um, I will give you uh, some examples that look like this that you're able to do yourself. Um, so we're gonna do this in a step-by-step -step process. Obviously that will all culminate in um, us doing our test, which will have more mathematics like this. If, um, if you're worried about it, I'll tell you now that the maths that you need to do in the test is uh, broadly speaking, similar to this. It's pretty much the same stuff. Um, if you can get this, you'll be fine in the test. If you if this makes no sense to you at all, uh, you're going to struggle in that test. As I said, watch this example. Go to the video where I've done the other examples. Work through those with me. Do the practice examples, and you should get there. If you don't do any of those things, if you just watch me go through this and then go into the test, uh, you're going to fail. You will not be able to do that test. You must, you must practice these. I'll just put, point this out as a general point. This is something I've learned in my life, is that if I'm ever required to do a thing under pressure or in a, um, in a uh, assessment type situation, whatever it is, uh, I don't want that to be the first time I've ever done that thing. Uh, if I'm training for something, let's say I was training to run a marathon, the day I need to do that marathon should not be the first time I've covered that distance because I don't know if I can get there. If my longest training run was 38 kilometers and the marathon is 42 kilometers, I've never done that last four kilometers. How will I know whether I'm going to be able to do that? The reason I say that is because there is, there is a pretty good chance that some of you watching this are going to uh, just watch the videos, go, okay, sweet, and then you're going to go into that test and expect to be able to do this first time. If you go into a test and it is the first time that you are doing this, you are going to struggle. How would you? Know, how do you even know? How do you know that you're going to be able to do it? So you must follow through the stuff. You must do the examples. Uh, you must do the practice calculations. Otherwise, you are going to struggle. All right, let's continue. Okay, first thing: calculate the inductive reactance. This is really easy. Two pi fl. We've been given our frequency. Uh, here it is here, I lost my pointer, there it is, 50 hertz. So we have 10 ohm, 10 ohm resistor, 0 0.05 henrys, capacitor is 220 microfarads, 15 volt, 50 hertz supply, okay. So inductive reactance, two pi FL, two times pi times 50, that's our frequency. L is our henry, 0 0.05. So we do that calculation, we get 15.71 ohms. Calculate the capacitive reactance. Well, that's 1 over 2 pi Fc, so that's different, uh, a little bit different. Just remember, if you're doing this example, if you're following along with me and you're using your calculator, first thing would be pause each time I bring up the next calculation and work it out yourself. But um, just, just practice doing this with brackets in the right place. I would put brackets around the 2 and here, and also put brackets around the 220 times 10 to the negative 6. But have a practice, have an experiment with that, and just make sure you confirm yourself where you need to put the brackets to get the right answer. Because if you do this on your calculator, 1 over 2 times pi times 50 times 220 times 10 to the negative 6. 220 times 10 to the negative 6 is our conversion of 220 microfarads into uh, farads. Then you should get an answer of 14.47. If you can't get that on your calculator, you need to keep practicing where to put the brackets until you get it right. Every calculator is probably going to be slightly different, so practice it on your calculator. Okay, we've got um, total impedance of the circuit. I think this is a little bit backwards. Oh, let me just bring it all up. There we go. So calculate the impedance of the coil. Well, in this case, the coil, uh, remember, had a resistance of 
10 ohms, which is just the resistance of the wire in that coil, and in, uh, in a, it had an impede, uh, inductive reactance of 15.71, which we just worked out on the previous slide. So to get the impedance of the coil then, we want, uh, we want to work out that triangle. So we've got a triangle, we're going to have resistance on the bottom, we're going to have reactance on the side, and our impedance will be the hypotenuse. So uh, we're going to use Pythagoras, so square root of R squared plus XL squared, which will be 10 squared plus 15.71 squared. Uh, so square root of that gives us 18.62, that is the impedance of the coil. Now if I wanted to work out the impedance of the circuit, and I do, then I'm going to use the same formula, pi, uh, pi, square root, my apologies, square root of R squared plus, and we have in brackets here, XL minus XC. So that's going to be our total reactance. So it's our reactance on the, of the inductor minus the reactance of the capacitor. Because the, uh, if we think about our triangle here, and I'll go through this in the maths video, if we think about our triangle, our resistance will be that horizontal side. Inductance is going to be the vertical side. Capacitance will be the vertical side, but one's going to be up, one's going to be down. Because remember, one's leading, one's lagging. So I've got a vertical side here and a vertical side here. So I need to subtract those two sides to give me one, one vertical side. So I'm, I'm combining the vertical uh, vectors. So just do that by subtracting one from the other. So it's going to be 10 squared plus, that's where we've got to put our variables in there. So it's our inductive reactance, 15.71. Our capacitive reactance, 14.47. Um, so 10 squared plus 15.71 minus 14.47 squared equals 10.08. Again, um, work that through on your calculator. Make sure that you can understand it and get the brackets in the right place and so forth. So our total impedance now is 10.08, which is, is not very different from our, um, our resistance. Why is it not different to our resistance? Because if you look there, our impedance and, uh, sorry, our inductive reactance, capacitive reactance are almost the same. If those two things were the same, then one minus the other would be zero, and therefore the vertical side of my triangle would be zero. So the total impedance will be the same as the total of resistance because I have a triangle with a bottom side and no, no vertical side. So then my hypotenuse must be, well, it's not even a triangle anymore, but if we try and think of it of a triangle with two sides, then the hypotenuse will be the same as the resistance. So we can see then that, um, that if, we, if our impedance would be equal to the resistance if the um, inductive reactance and capacitive reactance were the same. Okay, current drawn from the supply. Well, this one is easy because uh, we're just going to do uh, I equals V over Z, so just the normal um, Ohm's law. Uh, current equals voltage, total voltage, which was 15 volts, divided by total impedance, 10.08. So our current will be 1.49. And that will be present at, if it's a series circuit. The current will be the same, measure the same at any point in the circuit. Therefore, if I want to work out the volt drop across any of the individual components, I would use that capacity, that um, current, because the current will be the same everywhere. So V equals I times R, right? V equals I times R, that's normal. So in this case, we've got RR, which is the resistance and the resistor, to give us the voltage across the resistor. So V equals I times R, 1.49 times 10, 14.9 volts across the resistor. Voltage across the inductor, V equals I times XL, so that would be uh, the resistance of our inductor. 1.49 times 15.71 is 23.41 volts. Notice that the, the voltage across that inductor is uh, higher than the total voltage. Is the, uh, in these inductive and capacitive circuits, we have some quite odd situations such as voltage across individual components being higher than the applied voltage of the circuit. Um, uh, we could discuss the physics of that. I'm not sure that it will help. Just believe me. I think it's probably the best option there. Believe me. Voltage across the capacitance. Again, same formula. V equals I times XC. 1.49 times 14.47 equals 21.56 volts. Again, higher than higher than the uh, total voltage. 
So if we wanted to work out total voltage then, uh, total voltage, now we use, we're using a triangle again because we're going to use the, uh, where the voltage on our resistor will be on the bottom axis and then our reactive voltages will be on the vertical axis. It's the same, it's the same triangle. It's going to be the same every time. If we're doing power, it's the same thing. I know we've covered this before. I just want to really nail that together, that these triangles, um, we could use the triangle for voltage, triangle for uh, resistance triangle for power they'll all look the same the values will be slightly different but the ratios in any given circuit will be exactly the same therefore that triangle will be the same so we would use Pythagoras again but instead of doing um, X and R we would use the voltages so we've got the voltage on the resistor squared plus voltage on the uh, inductor minus voltage on the capacitor squared because that's just getting our um, vertical upside and a vertical downside and combining them together to one vertical side. So therefore, total voltage is the square root of 14.9 squared plus 23.41 minus 21.56 squared. And that gives us a voltage of 15 volts, ta-da, which is what we were told at the start is our total voltage. So we've gone all the way around in a circle and come back to the beginning. And if that equals the original to, uh, applied voltage we were given, then we must have done everything else correct. Impedance triangles for series circuits. So as I've mentioned, as we've gone through that, uh, the impedance can be expressed as a triangle. A right angle tri triangle can be used to illustrate the algebraic addition of resistance and reactances to calculate the total opposition to AC current flow. This is known as an impedance triangle. Capacitive reactance is opposite to inductive reactance. In a circuit containing both capacitive and inductive components, the reactance of one will counteract the effect of the other. So it means that uh, capacitors going one way, inductors going the other way. So we can always we can subtract one from the other because uh, that's how we that's how we add for, uh, that's how we add vectors together that are in opposite directions, right? And then we have it here. Ah, that looks very pretty. So uh, we have our resistance. That's on the horizontal axis. We have... Uh, oh no, my battery's running low. Give me a second. Let me pause. Okay, computer wasn't plugged in properly. Crisis averted. We're charging again now. So... Um, uh, resistance is on the horizontal axis there and uh, there's my inductive reactance and down here is my capacitive reactance down here is my capacitive reactance uh, so I can combine those two reactances in fact I must combine those two reactances that's where we get uh, so we have XL minus XC gives us that vertical side of the triangle and that's why when we're doing those calculations we use in our Pythagoras formula we use XL minus XC because we're taking those two vertical two vertical sides, two opposite vertical sides, and combining them together to give us one triangle. Essentially, we're putting these two triangles together, right? We put them together in one, so then this side will be our total impedance. It may be helpful in the example video I do, I've actually drawn triangles for each of the examples. It may be helpful for you to draw a triangle as you're doing these and just put in the, the sides. Not, not because you're going to work it out by triangulating it but it might just help you visualize what's going on um, RLC phasor diagrams phasor diagrams can be used to illustrate the relationships between current and voltage and reactive circuits in fact for a parallel circuit it is easier to calculate the circuits impedance from the sum of the current phases than it is by other means A voltage phasor diagram is used to illustrate and calculate the individual and total voltages around a series circuit. A voltage phasor diagram is not applicable to a parallel circuit as all components have the same voltage across them. Yeah, that's sensible. The voltages across each component of a series circuit may be of different magnitudes and of different phase angles. The algebraic sum of these voltages must equal the supply voltage. I'll let you guys read this. I'm just going to skim. I'm going to skim through it. Uh, 
Uh, so our phase diagram here is the same as our impedance triangle earlier. We have the voltage across the resistor, we have the voltage on our inductor, voltage on our capacitor, and so our total reactive voltage is represented here. So that's our, uh, this point here would be our induct voltage on the inductor minus the voltage on the capacitor gives us here our, volt our reactive voltage. So then this line here represents the supply voltage uh, and you can relate each of those to this diagram here. Current phase diagram for parallel circuits, right, because a parallel circuit, uh, sorry, in a series circuit, our current will be the same everywhere, uh, but in a parallel circuit, that is not the case. And it's no longer, again, just like in our series circuit, we saw that we can't just add our bolt drops together. In our parallel circuit with um, these different components, we can't just add our currents individual currents together. So a current phase diagram is used to illustrate and calculate the individual and total currents of a parallel circuit. A current phase diagram is not applicable to a series circuit as all the components have the same current flowing through them. The currents in each branch of a parallel circuit may be of different magnitudes and have different phase angles. The total current will be the algebraic sum of these currents, so the addition of these currents must include their phase angles as well as their magnitudes. And again, I'll let you guys read that. Can pause the video and have a read of that. I'll give it a second and move on. So here's our phase diagram for the currents. So here I've got current in the resistor, so that would be this current here. Here I have the current in the capacitor, it's this current here. Here I have the current in the inductor. I, I would work out those individual currents by using the applied voltage because the applied voltage here. Remember, in a parallel circuit, will be the same everywhere. So I just use that applied voltage divided by the resistance, because I equals V over R, and that will give me that I there. So then I would use this resistance, or the inductive reactance of that coil, and I would use the inductive reactance of that capacitor. Oh, sorry, capacitive reactance of that capacitor. And I would get my three individual um, currents. But to get the total current, I would then have to use the... Um, that same system. Uh, subtract the current on the, in the capacitor from the current in the inductor, and then use the resulting um, current as the vertical side of my triangle, with the current in the resistor as the horizontal side, and the uh, hypotenuse then will be my total current. The power in AC circuits, true power. The power that is supplied to resistors is referred to as resistive power. This is the power that performs the actual work of creating heat, light, and motion, and it's known as true power. So that's the power that we can use. True power is the symbol P, and this unit is the watt. This is the result of the circuit current and the circuit resistance, and can be found from the following equations, depending on whether they're series or parallel circuit. P equals I squared R, or P equals V squared over R. Power in AC circuits, reactive power. So reactive power is the power uh, that's used by the reactive components. That's our capacitor and inductor. It produces no useful work. It's not any value to us. So it's kind of wasted power. And we call it Q as our reactive power. So, uh, and X is our um, inductive or our reactant. So I squared X or Q equals V squared over X or uh, I times V, right? Q equals I times V. Um, X in this case is the the reactances in our inductors or capacitors. Uh, Q is the inductive power or reactive power. And then we have apparent power, which is the result of our total impedance. So this is a combination of our resistive power, true power, and our reactive power. It's the same triangle. The true power will be on the horizontal, the reactive power will be on the vertical, and then the apparent power will be our hypotenuse. Apparent power is how much, so the total voltage times total current and apparent power is what we pay for. That's why it's apparent power, that's how much we're paying. True power is how much we're using, how much we're getting, and apparent power is how much we pay for. The true power and reactive power together make up apparent power. Apparent power is the amount of power that must be delivered to a circuit, i.e. it's the amount of power as seen from the point of view of the supply. Apparent power is measured in volt amps. Apparent power has the symbol S, Apparent power can be found from the following equations depending on whether they are in series or parallel circuit. S equals I squared Z. So apparent power equals I squared, current squared times impedance, resistance. It's the same as our other formulas, right? Or uh, V squared over Z. 
And here's our power triangle, which is exactly the same as the other one. Our true power is on the horizontal axis. Reactive power, Q, is on the vertical axis. And therefore, our apparent power is the hypotenuse there. You can see that uh, the, the bigger my reactive power, then the longer my apparent power will be when compared to my true power, which means I have a poor power factor. I'm paying for this much power, the apparent power, but I'm only using this much power. So what I want to do is get my reactive power down to the lowest value possible. That's why if I have a big inductive power, then I put in a capacitor because my inductance minus my capacitance will give me a lower value on the on the uh, vertical axis or vertical side of the triangle and therefore my apparent power will be closer to my true power so the pay a power i pay for will be closer to the power i'm using power triangles can also be directly derived from power and from voltage and current phases associated with the circuit there's my voltage um, there and so i just multiply each of those values by the current and i'll get my power triangle Power factor correction. In an ideal circuit, all the current in the circuit and the supply voltage will be utilized and turned into true power. So just like I said, we want to minimize the reactive power so that our apparent power and true power are as close as possible. However, in reality, this does not occur because the reactive components in a circuit, they just exist, so we have to deal with it. And the circuit exhibits an inefficiency. This inefficiency is a ratio of true power and apparent power, and it's known as power factor. It, all can, it also can be found by power factor equals cosine of the angle that is present between the supply voltage and the supply current. In the maths video, I'll go through this a little bit more. I'll show you how to work it out. But the ratio of true power and apparent power means power factor is true power divided by apparent power. Apparent power. True power divided by apparent power. And also cos, cosine of the um, phase angle, which is just because they all relate together. They're just a triangle, right? So my true power is the hypotenuse. Oh, sorry, tr true power is the um, adjacent side to the angle on the horizontal, my um, hypotenuse is the apparent power, so cos of um, hypotenuse over uh, cos of true power over hypotenuse. Adjacent over hypotenuse, or true power over apparent power. Yeah. That's it. That's it for this one. Um, I'm, the next one I'll uh, we'll go through the the uh, some maths ex examples. Cool.